and welcome to your fourth, fifth, or sixth favorite reality TV recap podcast. That's right, it's Blighty Day Fiance. Here with me to recap 90 Day the Other Way, Season 5, Episode 17 and a bit. It's my learned friend, my colleague, my man, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday as well. Celebrated broadcaster, essayist, political commentator, and now reality TV recapper, it's Mr. Elliot Wilson. Hello, hello, and uh, uh, this is easily my first favorite uh, reality TV recap podcast. Um, so, uh, you know, I shall have none of this fifth, sixth, or seventh. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is easily the best, apart from the ones that you do that I'm not on, which I'm sure are even better. Oh, well... Hardly. Many many actually prefer uh, to have you. There aren't any that don't have me on it. Um, that might be something that we're going to test out in the near future. If you like what you hear today and would prefer to hear it ad-free, you can join us on Patreon, patreon.com slash Blighty Day. Blighty is spelled B-L-I-G-H-T-Y, and for just five U.S. dollars a month, the exchange rate is terrible right now. You get all of our shows ad-free, plus the Fundy Bus, which is Sister Wives and Plathville rolled into one Christian fundamentalist package. So head on over to Patreon, and we thank you for your support. We're very grateful to you all. Um, if you're in a tight spot financially and you're not able to contribute and you want to contribute in another way, we are running a little competition up through the new year now leave us a review on apple podcasts or on our youtube channel just slurch just slurch <laughs> just slurch blighty day fiance on youtube and you can find it uh you can also click the link in the show notes if you are not able to leave a review on apple podcasts you can leave one on any episode in our youtube channel. Winners will receive a limited edition Blighty Day Fiancé tote bag where you can let everybody in your family and wider community know that you are a winner. So um, that's all the housekeeping out of the way. Uh, I have to say, Elliot, this series, as we say here in the UK, is giving and giving and giving. It, it really is. There's there's almost, well, I was going to say there's no end to it. Obviously there is, because that's how schedules work. But, <clears throat> you know, you keep thinking, well, we've obviously had the, the biggest drama, the biggest reveal, or the biggest crisis, and then you sit back, and then another one comes along, and you think, well, I did not see that coming. And um, that ability to surprise and astonish, and in some ways shock, really does impress me. But most importantly, surprise and delight... Oh, always a delight, yes. I mean, I, I, I take it as read that I will be delighted by things which surprise me, because otherwise, what's the point? <laughs> um, well, perhaps not so delightful a surprise is Wayne and Holly. The wedding has, uh, has passed now. She's been in South Africa for three months, I think she said. Um, her mum has left. It's interesting because... In the in the earlier episodes, which, granted, um, you haven't caught up on yet, she was sort of, Holly was sort of teasing that uh, her mother would be staying with them for longer, and we were led to believe as an audience that we were going to get some drama to do with her mother staying there, but um, that's not the kind of drama that I enjoy uh, that goes under the rest of Wayne and Holly's drama, which is um, trigger warning, uh, pets in danger, people in danger, um, home alone style, uh, anti-theft, household modifications. Um, yeah. So not much going on here. She can't work. She can't leave the house. She stays at home alone much of the time because Wayne has to work all day and presumably into the evening to make ends meet. 
So it doesn't seem like she's got much of a life here. And I wanted to get your read on this, Elliot, because I can only guess that the reason they're not in the U.S. is because there would be an issue with getting Wayne a visa. I guess that must be right. I mean, there's something odd about... Well, I was going to say there's something odd about um, about the pair of them, and that that may well be true, but it may well be true. There's something odd about me. Um, I... I I can't quite get a grasp on them as a sort of as a pairing or as a uh, they they're not quite as real as the other ones there's a sort of veil between us and them and maybe it is that you know th- there's something that I feel we're not being told or I don't know that th- there's something slightly mysterious about it as if there's a missing piece um, but you know, pro, as, as on the face of it, it does seem quite a dull existence. I mean, Wayne, God bless him. I mean, all credit to him. You know, is is out working all the hours God sends after blowing all his money on crypto or whatever it was that brought about his previous financial catastrophe. Um, <laughs> and and good for him. Um, but it does mean that Holly's sort of sitting at home, can't go out because she feels it's 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 not safe, which may well be true. Um, but doesn't know anyone in South Africa and her mum's now left and um, I mean there was part of me screaming you know there are books but um, no it does seem quite a quite a I was gonna say dismal existence that's unfair a lonely existence at the moment Um, but there's there's still something a bit mysterious about it it's like when you're watching a drama or something and you haven't quite woken up or you've had too much to drink or something there's that slight fuzziness between you and them and you think um, there's something not happening I don't, don't don't know what it is yeah I I agree um, and we could speculate uh, and some of that speculation might trend towards the unkind um, it it is really hard to get a beat on these two because I feel like we're only ever getting part of the story. And I don't know if that's the edit. I don't know if that's what they're willing to share or not share. I'm just confused about why she would have agreed to come to this place. I mean, I understand there's restrictions on work and I'm not, I'm not, clear on the immigration laws in South Africa. So I don't know if it's that she can't work because of visa restrictions or if she can't work because it's not physically safe for her to work. Um, so I don't know why they would have gotten themselves into this kind of arrangement, knowing that it wouldn't be practical for her to work or spend any time outside the house and she's not able to make friends it's not yet yeah. so poor planning i think in I, part but i don't know i do think that like a lot of our contestants um they are they are people who are not necessarily massively well acquainted with consequences <laughs> you know, things just happen oh. to them I, right. I think that they're very well acquainted with consequences. I don't think that they make that... I don't think they do the mental gymnastics required to uh, connect those consequences with their own actions and their accountability for those actions. Now, you did say there are books. I briefly dated, as I'm sure I have said many times on this podcast, I briefly dated a Jehovah's Witness um, who was Irish. I didn't know that there was a big JW population in Ireland, but apparently there there are uh, a, a fair number of Jehovah's Witnesses. Go figure. I don't know. Um, they interpret the Bible literally. Uh, they do have pretty strict rules as far as I understand anecdotally from my own experience about the media that they can take in. Um, Holly's mom, I think, was reading a book that was sort of a Christian-themed romance, but I don't know... I don't know if the Amazon man delivers to Wayne's Neighborhood. First of all, <laughs> that, that may be that may be an issue, um, 
yeah, I, I'm I'm not a I'm not massively expert on on the witnesses. Um, although I, I did spend eighteen months living across a car park from a Kingdom Hall once in St Andrews, um, which sounds a lot older than it actually was in some ways. Um, but you know. All all faiths bring their own restrictions, but you know, th- 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 surely. I mean, since Gutenberg got going, we've churned out a lot of stuff. <laughs> uh, we really have, and you see that every time you go into a bookshop here. You think, um, it's extraordinary. I mean, you know, my friend Mark, who is a, a writer and, and screenwriter, says that you know, if if it was all about the quality of writing, then nothing bad would ever be printed, and we know that's not true. Um, right. Really oh, absolutely. Um, so, well, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know what her religious tenets are. I don't know what her religious restrictions are. Maybe she could read the Bible again, but I suppose it, it does Paul after a while. Uh, Paul not being a hilarious pun, by the way. Um, but I don't know. Fundamentally, I suppose there are people who are happy with a degree of interiority and there are people who aren't and she clearly is, is not one who is and that's not a criticism, it's just an observation. A more profound observation though and and this is I think this goes to the heart of the relationship and I hadn't really twigged this until I was watching it is my god that man's head is a weird shape it is a very odd shape it's like a a sort of anvil or something um, as delivered by the Acme company to Wile E. Coyote I mean it's it's very very odd it sort of builds towards a a chin but odd angles and my i all I can say is, Holly, if, if I woke up in the middle of the night, turned around and saw that, I'd be initially alarmed and then reminded of, of what I'd done. It is a it is a weird and I know that this is an insanely <laughs> esoteric reference um, that might also get me in trouble, but it's sort of like Chester Cheetah. Or, you know, like the the cartoon Cheetah from the Cheetos, from, from the Cheetos universe. It's like Chester Cheetah, I, I have a vague memory of there being an ad campaign where Chester Cheetah was in like an Egyptian hieroglyph. And so he had kind of like the King Tut beard um yes i'm aware he probably didn't have a beard i'm more talking about the sort of the stereotype on the sarcophagus with the the sort of you know the long the long hair and the beard um egyptology bays or listeners let me know if if you know what i'm talking about (laughs) and and if your egyptology course covered chester cheetah um <laughs> I think I think it would be under the the cultural significance bit of the Wikipedia entry, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um if I was King Tut, I would be pissed. Having said that, at least King Tut died thousands of years ago or, you know, a, a thousand and a bit. I'm very bad with with years and going back in time many, and stuff. Many BC thousands. and many thousands. It's what three, three okay. and a half thousand, I think. Something like that. Okay. I'm I'm bad with BC and A D. It's I've never been good at that. I've not, never been good at numbers to begin with. Um here in the UK and our we do have a handful of of British listeners or or listeners based here in the UK. There is an ad campaign that uses a likeness of Albert Einstein and they've, they've used AI to kind of bring him to life. And it is so fucking creepy. I don't know who owns the rights to that estate, but I would do anything if that were my relative to stop people mounting his face on someone else's body in order to sell, I don't know, in order to promote an electrical <coughs> company <coughs> or whatever it is. That creeps me out. It, it, I, I agree entirely, and I think the whole sort of deep fake AI thing can be massively both worrying and disturbing. But I do get slightly the impression of, of, of Einstein that he might be the one famous figure who might be all right with it because he looked like he had a laugh. Um 
I mean, it's difficult to get yeah, that's balance, true. Um, uh, brilliantly played, I thought, in Oppenheimer by Tom Conti of all people. Who saw that one coming? Um, but you know, he did look like he had a sense of humour, which I suppose you have to if you've unravelled the mysteries of the universe and stared into the the, the sort of very beginnings of, of not only humanity but existence itself. I haven't seen Oppenheimer yet. I I'm going to. Um... But I want to not have to watch the bomb part and go straight to the courtroom drama because that's all I'm really interested in. I'm told that the courtroom drama is the last hour and a half. Yes, I mean, it's it's slightly intertwined. So there may be a degree of disaggregation, <laughs> which is problematic. Um, it's a little bit well, like when, when I was a child and I, I hate green things in, in food, as you know, being Scottish and... My father, uh, when I was about six or seven, bought me an egg and cress sandwich. Now, I did not take to the cress very well uh, and said that I did not want the cress. And so he picked the cress out of the egg and cress sandwich. He used to tell this story and then he would always get the end of it and suddenly realise that he wasn't quite sure which of us looked more foolish in this, given that he'd been in his 40s and I'd been like six. Uh, but I, I, I fear that for you, Oppenheimer, maybe an egg and cress sandwich from which you're attempting to pick the cress. <laughs> Um, yeah, someone just make me a a cut of just the courtroom stuff. Um, it was a dark summer for me, so I, I tried to avoid any materials that were too, um, demanding of me emotionally. And then I saw Barbie and sobbed through the entire thing. So, um, Kimberly and TJ, let's head a bit further east from Joburg to Jaipur. Um, Kimberly, very emotional, totes emotion about her parents leaving. Uh, she's aware that there's a lot of healing to do, that this wedding and the the focus being put on that has sort of acted as a, as a band-aid or a temporary solution to the issues that she's been having. Um, with the family and with TJ's brother, with whom we have decided she's engaged in a passionate, illicit affair with. Um, she is understandably exhausted after being awake for 20 plus hours and fasting. Uh, what what was your take on the cake, Elliot? The cake was extraordinary. Um, I mean, I, I, more extraordinary was the fact that both of them were just still up and, and going at that stage because, you know, the, she, particularly Kimberly, stuck. She looked absolutely exhausted at one point. And I, I really did feel for her because you, I don't get there very often, thankfully, because I, I occasionally do sleep. But, you know, that sort of absolute bone deep exhaustion when you think I'm struggling simply to maintain motor functions here and anything beyond that is a win. And she was starting to have that look about her. But um, but no, the cake looked extraordinary. And I, I would happily have uh, happily have, have, have sat down and eaten all of that after fasting for 24 hours or 20 hours or however much it was. It did, did seem... A, I think it was 28. Dear I'm God. assuming, I'm assuming based on the 28-hour fast that no one gets married in India sort of post-35. Um because I don't know how anyone goes that long without eating. I don't think I've ever gone that long without eating. I've come close to that, but that was only because I was about to get a colonoscopy. So, um, yeah. I've, I've certainly I'm, never gone that length of time unless I was, uh, you know, substituting alcohol for, um, all the major food groups back in the old sure. days. Sure. Um, Kimberly says that she's the world's most unattractive eater. She compares herself to a, I didn't write down the name of the dinosaur, but um, yeah, I, I can relate to that too. I'm not a very she, attractive eater. She said that. I, and I mean, yeah, she did. She, she managed to get some, some cake beyond her face without it being you know, like <laughs> something out of, of saw too. I mean, it wasn't that bad. Um, I mean, I, I, I know that, you know, women do sometimes sort of, forestall criticism by saying oh I do this really un- inelegantly or whatever and it's it's most of the time not nearly as, as true as they're making out but you know if, if she wasn't going to sort of absolutely shove her face in the cake then I think you know we, we can all look away or make allowances and it's after all your wedding day or I say day days um, 
But um, no, I, I would have cut her some slack on that one. I couldn't help but call to mind in this moment a cake that was made for you um, in your image. Oh, uh, yes. yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> many people had, had thought that making images like that was, was, it, was at least unbiblical, if not actually um, immoral. But um, yes, I, I have had my... I was going to say I've had, I have had my face adorning a cake. I'm not sure adorning is, is quite the right... I have had presented to me a cake with a simulacrum of my face upon it. That is true. Um, we might have to post a picture of it in in the Facebook group or maybe in the Patreon-only group because, uh, because of the nature of... Um, Various for various reasons, okay. But I should say this is no way sexually explicit. Let me make that. Very no, 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 no. But also, it looks nothing like you. That that may also be true, but um, uh, and also those two things are not connected. Simply being not sexually explicit does not mean it doesn't look like me. But um, no, it, it, it's not not safe for work in that sense. But um, no, no, it, there are sensitivities. It, it wasn't. It wasn't a brilliant likeness, and it also looked exactly like a subsequent cake, which was supposed to be Robert Burns. He and I um, are often confused, actually. <laughs> okay. Um, right, so they get back. I was afraid that car was going to crash because that Uber driver was barely awake. He was nodding off on that road. I know they have, I know Kimberly uh, in a previous episode um, hit a rickshaw and wasn't very bothered by it. Um, So I guess they, maybe they, maybe everyone shares a very casual attitude toward um, possibly striking pedestrians there. I think that may be true. I think there is a a sort of Anglo Saxon relative anxiety about driving and i mean i I certainly observe that just driving in continental europe where people are you know uh you have a a brake or a horn you don't use both because why would you right um yeah but i think also just being relaxed about driving doesn't mean you're not going to have accidents or that people will get hurt um it just means that you you reduce anxiety beforehand i have to say i grew up driving in in some of the East Coast's most difficult cities when it comes to traffic. And I don't wish to cast aspersions or to draw any heat from this. So I'll just say that New England drivers are a special breed. Okay? That is true. Um, Nothing, nothing that I had ever experienced in New England could have prepared me for being in a car in continental Europe. And I won't say which country or countries, but it really is like people drive both like their lives depend on it and also that they don't value those lives at all and would very happily throw them out the window given the earliest opportunity ideally at a at a roundabout <laughs> I, I think you're entirely right and I'm, i suspect there is a fascinating thesis to be drawn about roman catholicism and, and approaches to, to driving <laughs> um because you know if you accept that this is just a, a veil of of tears and that there is a, a much better life awaiting us then then obviously it does put a, a coloring on the way you conduct yourselves and i would also say some of the worst driving i've ever seen uh, and, you know, hashtag not all nuns, but has been by nuns. And I think it's because they have such great faith in Jesus that they 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 have little regard for faith in anything else. I would also say, though, talking of driving in New England, one of the most adorable things I've found about New England is the way that, I mean, I've, I've seen, what, like two or three roundabouts, sorry, rotaries in, 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 in New England, and it's so lovely the way that there are about two or three of them, and no one knows how they work. And yet you, you come no. across from a country where we have them all the time. You go, yeah, okay. This. But there's a sort of, you, you reach the rotary, and then you just fling yourself into it. 
um, with a, a sort of vague faith that it will all work out. You think, we have these at home, they do work, and it's quite straightforward. But I suppose it's, you know, there not being very many of them means that you, you're not very experienced with them. But it, it's very, very touching and sweet. Um, I think roundabouts here are garbage. Uh, I think it's, they are designed specifically to frustrate Americans. I think King George the third invented them because he was bitter. Well, he um, was mad, so. He was mad, but he wasn't mad like mental illness mad or, um, you know, if rumors are to be believed, uh, sexually transmitted infection mad. He was angry and decided, you know what, I'm going to make it fucking miserable for Americans to come back. Okay. And, uh, you know, if you will drive on the wrong side of the road, then you're going to get confused when you come over here. Oh, Christ, on a bike. Um, anyway, driving, uh, going to the kitchen for the first time. I have to say, TJ's father, people seem to walk right through him. And he does have a thousand yard stare. Um, maybe he goes to weddings all the time and is constantly staying up all night. I don't know. But his role in the household is very clear in that he doesn't seem to have a very prominent one. Um, Kim goes to the most sacred place in the house, which is the kitchen. I was alarmed to hear that after... Uh, being awake for almost 30 hours, she would normally be expected to bake a fucking cake for her new family. That seems like a bridge too far. I know she's had days and days of of celebration um, where she hasn't had to do a whole hell of a lot and people have brought her gifts and things like that, but... It, it's not cumulative, though, is it? I mean... Do you... You know, I no. think if, if I'd been awake for 30 hours and somebody said, right, now is when you get to bake us a cake, I think my response would have been, you must be fucking joking. Um, I, it's my wedding day. I've been awake for 30 hours. I'm going to go to sleep right now and I'm not going to be baking any cake anytime soon. But she was much more restrained than I am, which is true of most of the population. You know... Considering who is currently hosting Great British Bake Off, or as it's known in America, the Bri Great British Baking Show, um, I'm surprised they didn't have, uh, they haven't had an, a stay up all night and bake a cake or stay up for 28 hours straight. Um, and I won't be making any further comment on that. I find the show almost unbearable. Well, you just made an enemy out of a large part of our audience because I dare say, I look, I really liked it in the beginning, but I am I'm Mel and Sue or no one. OK, I agree with uh, that entirely. I ride I like for Mel and Sue, and, Sue and uh, I accept no substitute hosts. Um, Right, so Kim's ultimate goal is to give living here a fair shot because she feels like they all need a new beginning. Um, based on her previous behavior, I'll be interested to see how that goes. Yeah, I mean, she does, she, she occasionally looks like she genuinely means it, uh, which is, you know, a, a lot of the battle. Um I, I do worry slightly about people who keep saying that you know they need a fresh start. You think who have you killed? Um, yeah, you know, right. Kind of refugee from justice. Um, what I also haven't really thought about because I suspect they haven't, and certainly haven't had a conversation about it, is if she decides that living in India is is not something she can contemplate. What's the significance of that for her and? And TJ, I mean, is this... Of course, it's not something I've talked about because he admitted that he hadn't actually talked about anything about no, the life no. that would be expected of her because nope. he didn't want to have an argument. You think, no, no, nobody likes arguments. I don't like arguments. But there are times when you have to take the lesser argument on the chin to avoid the massive shitstorm coming directly towards you. 
Yeah, again, very casual attitude towards um, consequences for actions. I mean, why some serious procrastinators here. Um, let's head over to DR for Danielle and Johan. So Johan has, since we last saw them, got a job. He is a debt collector. Uh, Danielle has noticed some suspicious activity on her bank account and uh, basically has caught uh, Johan in a lie. Um, she noticed some suspicious ATM withdrawals, and when she told him that she would have to ask for footage from the ATMs to identify who had been stealing from her, he finally admitted. But then he doubled down and said, there's no, there's actually no such thing as stealing from your wife. And it's a real shame because, uh, any high ground that Johan could have occupied and he is tall. So, you know, by default, he, um, you know, occupies some high ground. Ha ha. That was such a belabored pun. Um, he's lost it now. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, <clears throat> let me be quite clear. I am aware, uh, that a lot of people, uh, by which I mean, you indicate to me a lot of people, so it's probably true, are not <laughs> massive Danielle fans. And I can totally get that. I have no strong brief for her myself, and I can see how she might be quite difficult to to engage with, quite difficult to, to be around at some times, quite difficult to be married to, who knows. But I think the, the, the whole issue of the, the withdrawals from the cash machine was absolute washing away of, of any sins of the past it's tabula rasa it's you know she what had happened was clearly not ideal and there may be circumstances that she has created or or allowed to happen which led to him thinking well there's her card on the table i'll just use this i'll i'll go and you know whatever that that's all that's all debatable and, and murky and you can you can deal with that as you want but when she said i've got these strange transactions somebody's been taking money out of my account was it you and he said no and she said well i'm gonna have to get my bank to look at the cctv cameras and then he said oh well it was me but actually it's all your fault game over absolute game over um and then to to try to dig yourself out of it by saying well you can't actually steal from your wife interesting one could you just walk me through this by the way can you steal from your husband i'd be interested to know your views on that one um but just uh, no you can't do that you just can't do that it's a really it's contemptible really and i don't see how you come back from that i really don't i think no. that um She's had some cracking one-liners this season, including um, if you want another American wife who's emotionally codependent, I will refer you out. I was up um, and out of my chair cheering at that one. That was brilliant. So, so you know, kudos for that. But um, up until this point, I've I've really had a pretty strongly held belief that she had been selling Johan on the possibility of going to America and then taking that away um, when it didn't suit her. And I felt that, you know, the due to the nature of the imbalance of of uh, of power, that she's wrong most of the time in all of their arguments. I don't know that this is necessarily worse than any of the things that she's done to him, but I don't really think that's how relationships work, and I don't think that's how marriages ought to work. I think if you get caught up in, well, you did this and that was worse than that, I, I think these two have gone to such spectacular lengths to demonstrate how incompatible they are to each other. Um, 
I wouldn't blame either of them for leaving, and I don't think either of them should be embarrassed for doing the right thing and and calling it a day because this is it's dark. Um, Except I don't think he wants to call it a day because he was saying, "Well, I'm I'm not going to leave, and if I do leave, then you're going to give me money for the stuff I've brought and things like that." I mean, it's, it's digging into a horrible sort of. I'm absolutely willing to accept she she may not be a nice person at all. She may have behaved appallingly towards him. She may have created all sorts of unreasonable expectations. But I, I just try to imagine facing somebody that you are, you know, supposedly in a relationship which will last until death and beyond and all that kind of stuff, and saying, oh, well, you know, th- this money's been disappearing out of my account. And then first looking you in the face and saying, it wasn't me. Right. You know, we we all tell lies of various stages, but then when they say, "Look, I'm going to find out it's you," you don't then say, "Oh God, look, I'm really sorry. This is why I did it. That was really stupid." You say, "Oh well, uh, yeah, but it's your fault anyway," and you think, "Okay, um, I don't think we come back from this, do we?" Yeah, yeah, and and it's and the. The contempt that he... I know I've been throwing that word around a lot, but that's thats one of the the four horsemen of the... marking the, the end of the relationship, right? It's not... No, no further good can come of this. Um, and speaking of no further good can come of this, uh, Brandan and Mary... Um, they pick up Brandon's mom, Angela, and they're sort of on the little golf cart type things, surveying the kingdom, waving to the locals. Um, Mary is worried that Angela will judge her and how they live. Uh, why are you worried about that, Mary? Um, I mean, Angela's brought out classics like it's better than what i expected it's not a shack yeah that that was that was some impressive work sort of surveying uh the the relative lack of prosperity that she finds and saying wow this is a shithole oh but you don't live in the most shithole part of it um you know you've actually got like walls and stuff was you, you, in a, a in a nicer world you could see where she might be coming from i'm not sure she was but even so, it's it's kind of inadequate digging yourself out of a hole that you've created. It's really, yeah. I mean, I'm very sensitive to poverty shaming. Um, and so it's a behavior that I feel is inexcusable under any circumstances. I mean, considering that... I, now, having said that, considering all of the other landmines in this relationship, in this drama triangle, the poverty shaming is maybe what they have to worry about the least and the, you know, the judging. Um, I feel for Brandan because he's being shamed and manipulated on both sides and neither Mary nor Angela seem to give a shit about how he feels. No, I, I think they've they've both settled into archetypes, really, of the kind of um, uh, interfering mother-in-law and, and the scheming wife, um, in, into which archetypes they seem to fit almost as if into a, a tailored suit. Um and he is predictably stuck in the middle. Uh, the other thing, you know, I'm, I am sometimes less than overflowing with the milk of human kindness and sympathy. But I did occasionally <laughs> look at, at Brandon and think, there's no way out of this for you, is there? This is your no. life. You, Even if there were ways out in sort of uh, theoretical or practical terms, it, from your head, from where you are starting... This is this is your your existence, and there is not going to be a way unless you I don't know uh, get bitten by an enormous spider which has just shed its skin, which I didn't know spiders did by the way, um, or or you have a, a fatal accident or something. There's, he has that look of 
of hopelessness about him, which is in some ways profoundly depressing, actually, without wanting to 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 take it too seriously. You know, you look at him, you think, mate, this, I, I don't know what, I don't know where you go from here. No, it's, it's horrible. And the worst thing about this story is that it's impossible to make fun of because there's, it's so bleak and so sad. I mean, I am not in any way, shape or form a fan of either of these two, really. Um, Some listeners have said to me that they find Brandan to be quite a sympathetic character. I don't see that. I don't think that, that a relationship like the one that he has with Mary happens on its own because of one person. Um, I think that, you know, without having met each other and spent 24 hours a day on video chat, including on the toilet, um, it takes two to, to tango. It takes two. two, two. Yeah, exactly. Um, Although it really doesn't, it only takes one, but apparently for her it does take two. Apparently for, yeah, apparently for her it's, it's, and look, that may well have been his idea, but the point is we have two trauma bonded, very, very, very ill children who are about to bring new life uh, into this world, and there's just nothing fun or enjoyable about I, I, I do think about it's their story me off too that perhaps when people start relationships one of the initial questions should be just checking quick temperature check going for a shit solo or group activity and i think you know <laughs> that that could be a useful indicator of, of where your your partner's preferences lie yeah i mean um I also think that before you decide to try to have children, it might be worth fixing your relationship before complicating it further. But we all know that it doesn't tend to work out that way. Certainly not in in the world of reality television. Uh, yeah. Because children, if, the magical if, bond. <laughs> you just say, we're having yes, a problem exactly. with our relationship. Let's have a baby. Um. Now we come to we've I've saved the best for last. We come to the comic relief that never lets us down. Um we see a clip of Shekinah and Shariah talking and Shariah basically says, "Look, if I had seen any indication of love and respect coming from him to you, it might have changed my mind, but I didn't." So it hasn't. And I agree with her completely. There's just, but I, I feel that way. It It's really hard for me to buy that there's anything between them beyond the most superficial. And I'm not even buying the superficial part. It, it's mostly the way that they talk about sex and I might be, you know, I'm taking a stab in the dark here. I'm not saying that a man who can't dance is a man who is not a good lover, all right? But I am saying that a man who gets winded after 30 seconds of um, doing a sort of, you know, early to mid-2000s, Carmen Electra strip aerobics adaptation on his uh, fiance and gets winded from, you know, what, what doesn't look to be that strenuous is not somebody who's in a position to be counting orgasms. Well, I mean, to to quote, as seems appropriate, the the late great Matthew Perry, it's good that speed impresses you in this particular context. <laughs> no, I mean, there's something, ugh, there's something deeply, deeply, either <laughs> odd or dysfunctional about about Shekinah and, and Sapper, isn't there? Um, 
and I mean, there are, there, there are a number of possible explanations. The sort of sophisticated but cynical explanation, which, looking at the two of them, is probably not the correct one, is that they're just manipulating this whole thing as a, a, a sort of personal promotional platform and that they have a, a sort of uh, skillfully woven behind-the-scenes agenda. I look at those two and I don't see behind-the-scenes agenda screaming out from uh, what little light flickers behind particularly Sarfra's eyes. No, no, and I, I can't really help it, but I, I, I do think that there are some hidden depths to Shekinah. I think she's playing a role, albeit very poorly. Um, I do think she wants to be on TV. I think they both do. I think that you know the, but. I also think that neither of them are good enough actors to be pulling off anything particularly like this isn't this isn't some deep you know exercise sophisticated exercise here this is they're basically like a, a, an update of Boris and Natasha from Rocky and Bullwinkle you know, like that's about the level that we're on. Um. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't think either is a good enough actor to appear this bad an actor. If it were not real, right? Exactly. It's it's like that. Um, um, was it Huey Long who who once said, "You know, you're a fake. Everything about you is fake. Even your hair, which looks fake, is real." Um, and there's there's a sort of there's a blankness about both of them. Um, but particularly about about Sarpa, who who looks like he was sort of genetically engineered by by the intern. Um, it, it's just he's you know, this, so this... he is so slimy. I can't get over it. Like I, there's something very amphibious about him. Um, I feel like he leaves a snail trail wherever he goes like i was surprised that that bed that he's destroyed um wasn't sort of covered with a kind of viscousy film of sorts and i'm not talking about his other fluids (laughs) it was it was made of sponge but just this sort of and this like this I, I get very nervous around people who are that restless and th- there's such a, a he just has no chill. Do you know what I mean? Like he's so sweaty and desperate and just kind of <gasps> even on couch. How many times you came? Blah. You know, like it's just that whole there's a nastiness was, to it. Just. Extraordinary when you, you, you know oh, it, was, it was six times. No, our record was twelve times. You're thinking, mm, are you sure she was no. there for all of those? I'm really not yeah, I doubt that very much. I don't think they've. They might have had sex once to completion. I don't think. I like to think that I have a good sense for for what you know. Sometimes there's a there's an aura or an energy that comes off of a, of a of a gentleman even through the tv and often you know this is this is how stars are made right if you if that translates to the camera then um you know you've you've got the makings of a of a matinee idol he's got zero game his aura is like slimer from ghostbusters it's it's repellent to me. And I hate it. <laughs> he, uh, but I also he is, love watching it. Oh, absolutely. But I mean, he certainly he, he strikes me as a man who, who fakes his own orgasms when he masturbates. Um, you know, he's he just... Uh, th- there's a sort of overwhelming... Uh, it's, it's not quite sort of self-obsession because obsession would uh, imply a degree of, of higher cognitive function which I'm not sure Sarper 
is really on the same page as. But the, 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 I mean, that conversation about how much they enjoyed having sex and when they'd had sex and all, they were sitting on this bed and they're probably going to have sex on the bed and all that kind of thing. I mean, the, the complaint, the, the story about the complaints from the neighbours. Oh, come on. I mean, I... Right. The, there is only yeah, maybe one because the TV was too loud. Or that persistent smell from his drains that won't go away. I mean, that's the only kind of complaint that man has had oh. from the neighbours. Um, no, oh, it's... for sure. I mean, if God help you if you've ever used a Starbucks bathroom that's near a gym. Because you know what protein, the, the foulness of a protein dump that a, a, a feckless man has dropped in a public restroom. Um, and on that beautiful sense memory, uh, we are going to leave it there. Tell them where they can find you, Elle. Uh, I'm usually on Twitter at Elliot Wilson 2, E L I O T W I L S O N 2. Yeah, that's how my name is spelled. I'm just checking. Um, so, yes, have a look over there. Or, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I've, I've occasionally uh, retweeted uh, podcasts, uh, editions of this podcast that I've, I've appeared on. But, yes, Twitter is the main place. And uh, um, I'm always happy to, to engage in, in banter of a light hearted or serious nature as the conversation requires. And we are now able to, I think I've mentioned this before, if I haven't, please forgive me, um, but Elliot and I are going to be covering Ryan Murphy's feud, The Swans, which doesn't yet have a premiere date that I'm aware of, but it's going to be early 2024. It's our first foray into covering dramatic television. Um, Elliot and I have uh, an affinity for stories about that particular group of people we've done loads of research and if you are a fan of ours and a fan of our um previous patreon only show royalty which will return in some form or another again in 2024 when th when the bulk of my law exams are over um you are going to love this we've done loads of of prep work for it and we are super excited to either revel in how masterful the performances and storytelling are or uh pick it apart mercilessly until nothing but spiny little fish bones remain um so from everyone here at Blighty Day Fiance, it's Michelle and Elle signing off. We will see you soon. <laughs>